Well, we come today to another warning passage in Hebrews, and this one is no doubt the most difficult of all. Uh, George Guthrie writes, it is no exaggeration to designate the passage we now consider as one of the most controversial in the book of Hebrews, indeed, one of the most disputed in the entire New Testament. He says the phrase in verse 6, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, has caused, quote, a great deal of anxiety among those who read the book of Hebrews, end quote. One commentator said this passage has occasioned considerable discomfort in the history of interpretation. There are at least six different views or ways of interpreting this passage, and they all have names. Uh, There is the hypothetical view. There is the pre-conversion Jew view. There is the covenant community view. There is the true believer under judgment view. There is the phenomenological true believer view, and there is the phenomenological unbeliever view. Now, I'm not going to go through all those, but suffice it to say that there has been a lot of disagreement on this passage, and that tells us we must walk through it carefully. One thing I believe we can rule out immediately is the notion that this passage teaches that a genuine Christian can ever lose his or her salvation. The rest of the New Testament is too clear on that. And even if we concluded this is what it teaches, we would also have to say that it teaches that someone who does, in fact, lose their salvation can never get it back. You can't have any of this getting saved and then getting lost and then getting saved again. Not according to this passage. If you believe this passage teaches that you can lose your salvation, then it also teaches that you can't be renewed again to repentance. But of course, the Bible nowhere teaches that. The Bible teaches that a genuine born-again believer is secure in Christ and can never lose his salvation. There are many passages that teach that, including the golden chain of salvation in Romans chapter 8. And I don't really have time this morning to make the biblical case for eternal security. We've kind of seen that along the way. But it is clearly taught in passages like John 3.16, John 5.24, John 6.39-44, John 10.27-29, Romans 8.29-39. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Colossians 3, 3, and many others. What we have in Christ is called eternal life, not temporary life. And the clear teaching of Scripture is that if you become a genuine child of God, you can never be anything but a child of God. Nothing can ever change that. So whatever view you have of this passage... One thing is for sure, no born-again Christian ever has to worry about losing his or her salvation. And you should not let this passage trouble you because this passage is not teaching that. As we approach the text, there are some things I think we need to keep in mind. First of all, this passage is notoriously ambiguous. And what I mean by that is the fact that the author uses certain terms without defining what they mean. This has created a lot of speculation among interpreters as to the correct original intent. Now, one of the reasons why this is the case here may be the fact that this is an exhortation. This is not part of his exposition, so he may not be as careful about his theology here as he is in other sections. In other words, 
the primary purpose for this section is to motivate them to action, not to give them theological instruction. This may be why he does not stop to define his terms. Now, of course, this is not to suggest that the author of Hebrews is not thinking biblically in his exhortations, but here his theology is presupposed. He is calling them to respond to the theology that he has previously given to them. And in this case, we need to keep in mind that this particular exhortation goes all the way from chapter 5, verse 11, to chapter 6 and verse 12. And as I have pointed out, there are four distinct paragraphs in this exhortation. And this one today is paragraph number three. So we need to keep this in context here. We have seen in the previous two paragraphs that he launched into this exhortation because he wants to go into a deeper discussion of Christ being a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, but he can't do that yet because they are dull of hearing, he says. And he says they're not ready for solid food because they're hanging on to the elementary principles. They're still at the ABC level, and they need to let go of that and go on to maturity. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he admonishes them to completely leave the elementary stuff and go on to the mature. And in my understanding, this is likely a contrast between the old covenant and the new. He is telling them to leave behind the pictures and the symbols of Judaism and embrace the realities of the new covenant. When we get to verses 4 through 8, he is warning them of the great danger of apostasy, which in this case would be their returning to Judaism and rejecting the new covenant. I believe, especially here, that the warning is being written to those who are right on the edge of committing themselves to Christ, but are in danger of falling into apostasy and returning to Judaism. I also believe the warning is that if they do that, there is no more hope for them because there will be nothing else that could be done for them. They will have experienced everything possible that is intended to lead them to Christ, and yet they have made a firm rejection of him. Now, we'll talk about this later, but the reason why I believe this will be final is because of the hardness of heart that accompanies apostasy. That is the main reason. This is why the author of Hebrews says that in the state of apostasy, it is impossible for them to be renewed again to repentance. So I'm taking this passage to be directed toward unbelieving Jews who have not yet made a commitment to Christ. And they are in danger of returning to Judaism and thereby losing their opportunity of eternal life. What does seem certain from this passage is that these Jews are very closely associated with the church. And the great debate has been whether they are believers or if they are those who are intellectually convinced but uncommitted. Now, there are two more issues, I think, that are important before we move into the text First, we need to make note here that he's not saying they have apostatized. He's saying they are in danger of apostatizing. He is giving this warning in hopes that they will go on and commit themselves to Christ. He's hoping they will see the danger and heed the warning. 
And that's why he writes in verse 9 that he is convinced of better things concerning them. He has hope that they will listen to the warning and avoid the apostasy. Second, I want to mention something important about the structure of this passage. The New American Standard has the word impossible in verse 6, while most English translations have it in verse 4. It is, in the Greek, the first word of the sentence which makes it emphatic. So it should be in verse 4. The main part of the sentence reads like this. It is impossible for those to be brought back to repentance. That's the main sentence. Then there are a series of participial clauses that modify that statement. Who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, etc., The definite article in the Greek, those who, governs all these clauses. So it refers to the same group of people. So the idea is, if all these things are true, and yet they have fallen away, then it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. I like the way J. Adams puts it. He says the entire argument runs this way. If you have had all the benefits of association with the people of God, but at length determine that this is not for you and leave, there is nothing more to say to you. You have not only known the truth of God, but you have seen evidence of the Word of God's Spirit, and you know both intellectually and experientially all that could be told or shown. That's what I believe we have in this passage of Scripture. So let's move into it now. And there are three main elements that we see in this passage. The first one consists of the advantages, the advantages. Now, we're taking this according to the New American Standard, but that may be a little different depending on if you have some other translation. The Hebrews being addressed here have five great advantages which are summarized in verses 4 and 5. These are benefits for being closely associated with the church. Now, some have connected this with the wilderness wanderings that the author of Hebrews referred to earlier. Some scholars even believe that this is where the idea for these five advantages come from. And if you think about the account of the sending out of the 12 spies at Kadesh Barnea, which ultimately led to the rebellion of Israel and the wilderness wanderings, All these five were true of them. They were enlightened by God. They had samples of the fruitfulness of the land. They, in a sense, tasted its wonders. They knew the sure word of God in promising to give them the land. And they had witnessed firsthand his mighty miracles. And yet, with all that, they rebelled and refused to enter into God's rest. The word of God and his power are linked in this passage, and the language is reminiscent to those who fell in the desert because of their lack of faith, even though they had heard God's voice and they had seen his mighty acts. F.F. Bruce has written, Just as the Hebrew spies who returned from their expedition carrying tangible tokens of the good land of Canaan nevertheless failed to enter the land because of unbelief, so those who had come to know the blessings of the new covenant might nevertheless, in a spiritual sense, turn back in heart 
to Egypt and so forfeit the saints' everlasting rest. I think it's good to see this connection here. So what are these great advantages these Hebrews had? There are five of them, beginning with the advantage of substance. Substance. In the New American Standard, it reads like this in verse 4, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened. Stop right there. Many take this as evidence that these are believers. But that is not necessarily the case. The Greek word for enlightened is the word photizo. It means to cast light upon or to make known. It means to reveal. Uh, One Bible scholar says it speaks primarily of understanding. And we get a good clue as to how the author of Hebrews is using this word by looking at his only other use of it in chapter 10 and verse 32. There he says, But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. Now, other English translations have there, after being illuminated or after receiving the light. This is also how the word is used in the Septuagint. It is translated several times as to give light by knowledge or teaching. It means to become mentally aware of something or to be instructed in it. It carries no connotation of response, no connection at all with acceptance or rejection, with belief or disbelief. It simply means to be informed. So the enlightenment of Hebrews 6 8 is probably intellectual perception and not necessarily genuine belief. Now, an illustration of this concept is found in Jesus' ministry to the people of Galilee. Our Lord said that he came to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, and part of that reads, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And yet we know that not all who saw that great light were saved. Some were, many were not. They all saw the light. They were all enlightened, but not all of them responded to the light with saving faith. (coughs) This tells us that seeing God's light and accepting it are two different things. It is said of Jesus... Uh, In John 1, 9, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Yet we know that not every man is saved. Many who saw the light of Christ were not. The concept of being enlightened is not limited to those who are saved. They were all enlightened in the sense that they all saw the light. They all saw Christ. They all heard his words. They all saw his miracles. They all had knowledge of him, factual information they had from firsthand experience. And yet most of them did not put their faith in him and follow him as disciples. They were all enlightened, but they were not all saved. And in the same way, in Hebrews 6, 4, we would have to say that it is possible for these Hebrews to be enlightened and yet not be saved. In fact, John MacArthur makes the interesting and important observation that none of the typical New Testament words for salvation are used in this passage. You don't say anything at all about a justification, about sanctification, the new birth, regeneration, being born again, being made holy, being made righteous, etc., etc. He says, in fact, no t- term used here 
is ever used elsewhere in the New Testament for salvation. And none should be taken to refer to it in this passage. Now, I would have to say that it would be very difficult for a person to make the case that these are necessarily believers based on the word enlightened alone. But you say, Pastor, you know, it's combined with the other clauses that makes the case that these are believers. None of these necessarily means that they are born again. Look at the second one, the advantage of getting a taste of salvation. Verse 4 goes on to say, and have tasted the heavenly gift. Now, there's been a lot of debate about what this heavenly gift is. Since there are several things in Scripture referred to as a gift, it could be any of them. The Holy Spirit is spoken of as a gift. But since the Holy Spirit is going to be mentioned next, this is probably not what he has in mind here. Christ himself is called a gift, as well as the salvation that he came to bring. And so it is likely a reference to that. I'm using the word salvation, but the real key here is what does the word tasted mean? What does it mean when it says they tasted? Does this mean they had the experience of the new birth and were saved? Or that they had experienced what salvation is by being around others who were saved? I believe it means the latter. As John Carthur puts it, it was not accepted or lived, only examined. They just got a small taste of it. Tasting is not eating. Tasting is not drinking. If you taste something that doesn't taste good, you spit it out. You don't ingest it. Tasting is just getting some sort of idea whether you want to drink it or not. This is similar to what the Israelites experienced at Kadesh Barnea. They got just a little taste of the land of promise. They got just a little taste of its fruit, but then they had to decide if they were going to go in and possess the land or not. And there is a sense in which a person must taste the salvation of God, to see if it is something he wants to commit his life to. That is part of the pre-salvation work of the Holy Spirit. You have to hear enough about the gospel and witness enough of what the gospel is capable of doing before you make a commitment to it. As John MacArthur writes, the Spirit of God place the blessing of salvation to their lips, but they hadn't yet eaten it. Then there's the advantage of the Spirit. Verse 4 continues, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Again, what does it mean to be made partakers? Does this mean that the Holy Spirit had taken up permanent residence in them? Or that they had some association with the work of the Spirit. Again, in this case, I believe it means the latter. The Greek word, metakos, has to do with association, not possession. It's used in Luke 5, 7 to refer to fishermen who had association with other fishermen. Is used in this book, in chapter 1, verse 9, to refer to Christ having association with the angels. It has to do with sharing in common associations and events. And here in Hebrews 6, 4, it has to do with being around the work of the Spirit. It has to do with witnessing the work of the Spirit. It is possible to do that and not be born again. J. Adams writes, to see the evidences of the Holy Spirit at work all around you, 
to see lives change, changed, prayers answered, people saved, is to taste and share in what is happening among God's people as the Holy Spirit moves uh, in their midst. MacArthur says, like most of the multitudes, when Jesus miraculously healed and fed, they partook of the Holy Spirit's power and blessing, but they did not have his indwelling. They did not possess the Holy Spirit, and he did not possess them. They experienced it. They saw it. They were even part of the blessings of the Spirit. But that doesn't necessarily mean they were genuine believers. Fourthly, we see the advantage of the Scripture. Look with me at the first part of verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God. Again, you have that word tasted there. They got a little taste of God's word. Interestingly, the word for word in that verse is not the normal Greek word that you would expect. It is not logos, but rhema, meaning that this is a portion of the word, not the whole word. I believe this is referring to the fact that they had been under the teaching of the Scripture in the church, but they had not come to fully understand God's Word because they were not yet born again. The Bible says a natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. A lost person can taste the good word of God by going to church and sitting under the preaching of it. They can learn a lot about God and about the gospel without being born again. But they can never fully understand it until they are spiritually regenerated. And I think this is what the author of Hebrews is describing here. These are are Jews who had been in association with the church, and they have come under the teaching of Scripture, and yet they had not made a commitment to Christ. Then, fifthly, we see the advantage of signs. Verse 5 goes on to say, and the powers of the age to come. This is a reference to the miracles that were part of the apostolic age. These were a foretaste of the miracles that will characterize the millennial kingdom. These Jews had witnessed these powers. They had seen the kind of miracles, the same as Jesus performed, and the signs and wonders of the apostles. They had tasted this miraculous power. And we saw back in chapter 2, verse 4, God also bearing witness with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles. They saw healings. They saw resurrections from the dead. They tasted these amazing powers that the Bible says will be prominent during the millennial kingdom of Christ. And yet, with all these advantages, they had not made a firm commitment to Christ. In fact, their guilt was greatly increased by having all these advantages and not saying yes to him. In fact, the Bible indicates the more we are exposed to these kinds of things, the word of God, the work of the spirit, the witness of changed lives, etc., the more guilty we stand before God if we reject the gospel. And that's the whole message here. But We need to move on now, secondly, to the apostasy. Look with me at verse 6. And then, having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Again, he's not saying that the believers or that his hearers have fallen away. He's saying that if they did after having all these advantages, it would be impossible to renew them again to repentance. Now, some have tried to soften 
the word for fallen away here to say that it doesn't necessarily mean apostasy. But the terminology that is used of re-crucifying the Son of God and putting him to an open shame, along with the analogy in verse 8 of being burned up, makes it clear that apostasy is what he's talking about. Others have tried to soften the word impossible, but I would say that is impossible in this verse. The same word is used in chapter 6, verse 18, to say it is impossible for God to lie. Now, you can't really say it's difficult for God to to lie. No, it's impossible for God to lie. It has to mean that. Another example is in chapter 10 of verse 4. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That means exactly what it says. There is no way that the blood of bulls and goats can ever take away our sin. You see the same thing in chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That has to read that way. All three of these passages are nonsensical if you make the word impossible mean difficult. The word impossible in Hebrews 6.6 clearly means this is something that cannot happen. What is it that cannot happen? Apostates cannot be renewed to repentance. Now, the word for renew there means to bring back to original condition. It means to restore. The original condition of these Hebrews is that they were initially excited about the gospel. They had moved away from Judaism. They were right on the edge of repentance and saving faith. They were just a step away from the kingdom of God. But if they fell away after having all these advantages and after being this close, they could not be brought back to this point again because this would mean that their hearts would have become hardened. They had seen it all. They had heard it all. They had experienced it all. So if they rejected it and turned away from it in unbelief, there is nothing more that could be done for them. It would be impossible to bring them back again to the place where the gospel was new and sweet and hopeful for them. They could not get back to that place again and ultimately because of the hardness of their hearts. Here's the principle. When a person rejects Christ at the peak experience of knowledge and conviction, he will not accept it at a lower level. Let me say that again. When a person rejects Christ at the peak experience of knowledge and conviction, he will not accept Christ at a lower level. You'd better receive Christ when you are first made aware of the gospel and convicted by the Holy Spirit of its truth. Because the more you say no after that, the harder your heart will become. And the Bible clearly teaches that it is possible to get to a place of hardening in which a person no longer has the opportunity to be saved. Now, there's a whole lot here that we could spend time on. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but we're running out of time. So let me give the rest of this to you very quickly. Notice why he says it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. This simply means that as far as they are concerned, Jesus got exactly what he deserved. In their apostasy, they are siding with the crucifiers of Christ. In other words, they're saying, we agree with the verdict of the Jews who put him on the cross. 
They are saying, we agree, he is not the true Messiah. Apostates cause the shame of the cross to be reenacted. O'Brien says, they not only show their contempt for Jesus, but they also make him contemptible in the eyes of others, deterring them from coming to faith in Christ. Notice it's not the fact that they are taking up a hammer and some nails and putting him on the cross literally. They are doing that, this by virtue of their apostasy. My friend, listen. It is a very dangerous assumption to think that you can just stay on the sidelines and do nothing in regard to Christ and to think that just because you do not openly oppose the gospel that you will be okay. Jesus said, he who is not for me is against me. The longer you know the truth and put off receiving him, the closer you come to full apostasy. The closer you come to joining in with the crucifiers of Christ and sharing in their guilt. Any person who fails to put their faith in Christ for salvation will ultimately end up in apostasy. Eventually, their hearts will become completely hardened to the gospel and their fate will be sealed. They will again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. They will incur the very guilt of those who nailed him to the cross. This is how serious it is to continue to reject Christ. Well, there's one last thing. We're out of time, but one last thing we see here, and that is the analogy. In verses 7 and 8, he gives an analogy to summarize his point. Look at it with me. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls upon it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, <coughs> it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. This is a simple analogy, and we should not read too much into it. This is very similar to the parable of the soils that Jesus gave. The rain is the gospel, and the soil represents the hearts of men. Some are like the good soil, and they receive the message of the gospel and respond with saving faith. As a result, their lives are filled with great blessings from God. But those who reject the message and fall away will ultimately end up with thorns and thistles and weeds. Ultimately, they will face the judgment of God and be good only for burning. And the point is, it is the very same rain, but it falls on different soils. The gospel is proclaimed to all, but not everyone embraces it. So what is the warning and how should we respond this morning? The warning is, it is never enough to accept the truth of the gospel intellectually while failing to commit yourself to Christ in saving faith and genuine repentance. The very same situation is common in the church in America today. There are thousands and perhaps millions who have heard the truth of the gospel over and over again, but have not experienced true spiritual regeneration. They are just like these Jews who were right on the edge of salvation, but were in danger of missing it altogether forever. Don't be like them. Don't side with the ones who put Christ on the cross. Don't fall away and miss eternal life through faith in Christ. I'll close with these words by John MacArthur. He says, don't you ever put off the decision to receive Jesus Christ when it sounds sweet, when it is still fresh. With all your doubts and all your misgivings and all your misunderstandings and the things you'll never be able to understand till you know Him, 
Come to Jesus Christ just as you are, lest you get to the place where hardness and callousness and impossibility sets in. That's the warning. What will we do with it? Let's pray together. Father, we pray that we will heed this warning. And Lord, our prayer this morning is that if there's anyone here today that is close but has never taken that final step of commitment to Christ, that they would do that today. Lord, I pray that there would not be dullness of hearing, that there would not be hardness of heart against the gospel, but Lord, that there would be openness and sensitivity. And Lord, I pray that uh, those who, who know, who have been around the church, who have seen these things and heard the truth of Scripture and are intellectually convinced that this is right and yet have not yet repented and put their faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation, that they would do that this morning. And Lord, I pray that all of us would understand your truth, that we would uh, be about your work. And Lord, I pray that we would understand this is an urgent warning, something that we are to be about warning others who are, are headed toward eternal condemnation. So Lord, help us now to respond the way you want us to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we always uh, allow you that opportunity to